so good afternoon, everybody. Before I introduce myself, I want to say one of the true joys of this job is watching people dance in the bottom of the screen in the little toolbars I have. Uh, if you guys are dancing in your classes, all the better. I love that enthusiasm. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we run 40 to 50 live, free, interactive broadcasts every single month. I know this special program series as part of the Week of Wonders introduced a lot of you to what we do, and it has been so thrilling to have so many new classrooms coast to coast to coast join us for this special festival. So, as I said, it is the Week of Wonder. We are uh, most of the way through day two. We've got another program after this, highlighting the amazing science centers across Canada. Now, these places are where people go, millions of people go every single year to learn about the world, the cosmos around them. There's so much to discover. They are open across Canada, and so I hope all of you get the chance to go in person as a classroom as a family in the weeks and months to come till that day till you get the chance to go in person hopefully this is the next best thing as we highlight the virtual program offerings of all these amazing centers so today alone we have been all over the country we've been in ontario we've been in newfoundland we've been in quebec and now we are going all the way over the country to midway up bc in lovely prince george a town i had the chance to visit a couple of years back one of my favorite places in canada to go visit the exploration place so today they are going to walk us through some of their amazing animals meet greet and see what they eat we're going to get to learn about some of their unusual critters and see what's going on get your questions ready i'm so excited to dive in with this broadcast and without further ado i'm going to turn it over to our friends at the exploration place welcome in guys and take us away hello thank you so much jesse we are so so very excited to be here with cap today and with exploring the seat of your pants uh like jesse said we've got a couple critters for you today so we are located in prince george on the unceded traditional territory of the clinton today and we are called the Exploration Place. Now we've been closed for roughly two years or so now because we are creating a brand new wonderful space for everybody to come to. So we'll be opening sometime after the new year. And something really exciting about that is the fact that we're actually gonna be an accredited zoo. So we're gonna have tons of critters that are gonna be here that you can come in and see, sometimes handle and get to know. Now, my name is Jacqueline, and I manage our virtual programming here at the Exploration Place, and I'm here with Sabrina, who is our head keeper. Now, she's going to be showing off a couple of our critters that we have. Who do we have today, Sabrina? This here is Bubba, and Bubba is probably one of our most popular animal ambassadors that we've had here for a long time. Um, she has seen many, many, many gifts over the years, and hopefully when we open up again, she'll be able to see thousands more because she definitely delights crowds <laughs> even though she's pretty small <laughs> she's one of my favorites that's for sure now where do we find garter snakes where are they traditionally living like i know i know bubba's got a nice little cage downstairs but where do they actually grow yeah bubba lives here with us um the really cool thing about garter snakes is they're actually the most widely distributed reptile in all of north america so you can find them all the way out from alaska where you wouldn't find um any other types of reptiles or snakes um all the way down to mexico so and from coast to coast. So you can find them all throughout Canada, throughout the States, throughout um, Mexico, as I said. Uh, this species is called the Western Terrestrial Garter Snake, and this is one of the species that's found in our region. So there's lots of different types of garter snakes, lots of different subspecies. Um, and these ones don't get too big, but um, the other species that we have here reaches about four feet. So that, that's about as big as you get for a garter snake. So. Right on. And I know we've got a couple here, and the bubble looks like one of our bigger ones. So why is Bubba bigger than some of our other garters? So that's a good question. Even though Bubba is not a super big species of garter snake, she is pretty large for a garter snake. And that is because the females are a lot larger than the males. So a lot of the time when we have guests in here seeing the animals that we have on display, we have two males here and we have two females as well. And the males are about a third the size of the females. Um, that's not with all snakes, but with a lot of different snake species, the females are a lot larger than the males, and that goes for garters as well. So people often think the males are babies, even though they're the exact same age. Even though they're brothers and sisters, they think yeah. they're babies. Yeah, always oh, fine. Now, if we can get actually a close-up um, on looking at the back of Bubba here, there's a whole bunch of different colors and patterns. What might that be used for, Sabrina? So you can see that it's kind of splotchy and um, Similar to what would be a checkered garter snake, it's kind of a, a blocky pattern there. Um, just the region where these guys are from, they would be able to blend into their surroundings, so the grass, the leaf litter, things like that. You can usually find them near bodies of water, um, and they actually spend a lot of their time in and around the water. But 
obviously they need to camouflage because they're not super big and there's a lot of different animals around here that would like to eat these guys. <laughs> so they are uh, they're definitely just trying to hide uh, in our college to do that. For sure. What kind of critters would actually eat this guy? Um, foxes eat them. Uh, sometimes other animals like coyotes and stuff. Um, foxes are a main predator. Domestic cats are actually a huge problem for them, uh, as with other local wildlife. Um, but also other snake species um, that can be found within the same regions as they are found, like throughout the states and um, and throughout like up here. I think the closest thing you would find is probably a uh, gopher snake would eat these guys. Um, and as well as lots of different bird species and things like that. So there's basically anything that is bigger than them. They're, and they're not that big. So, so they gotta run away a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, they do. They, they're either hi hiding from predators or looking for prey, basically, 100% of the time. <laughs> and talking about prey, so we did title this um, What They Eat as well. So we are actually going to be showing a live feeding with Bubba here. Um, and I'm wondering if anybody can guess maybe in the chat, we've got a couple of live classes with us. What do you think this snake might eat? Ooh, we've got tons of classes in the chat, but oh, okay. 13 classes in the chat from Alberta, BC, South Carolina, across Ontario, Alberta, everywhere, all over the place. So if people do have quick comments in the chat, please do share there. What do we think you might eat? And then our live classes, of course, you guys can share in the StreamYard chat as well. I've uh, we got groups in Florida as well. Holy, mice is the first guess. So mice is a good guess from Guru Nathan on YouTube. Uh, in our private chat here, Ezra and Piper bugs. I like it, okay. Anyone else have any ideas? Deer, antelope, mice, meat is very generic. I like it. Mice is our, our most common option so far. Small rooms. Yeah. What do you think, guys? Hmm. Yeah, awesome. Those are all great guesses. Um, and actually, you can find garter snakes in all of those places that we just listed. So you guys can probably see garter snakes when you're out in the summertime, um, exploring the wilderness, wherever you are. <laughs> um, so these guys, mice is a really good uh, guess. We do feed them um, small mice and rats here. And in the wild, they sometimes eat small mammals, um, shrews, mice, things like that. Their primary food sources in the wild are actually fish, frogs, um, and things like slugs and worms. So when they're really little, they eat earthworms, slugs, and things like that, sometimes snails. And as they get bigger, they start to eat larger prey like frogs, toads, uh, as well as fish, salamanders, anything like that. They'll even eat smaller snakes if they get the opportunity. So anything that fits in their mouth, but part of the reason that they do hang out a lot near the waterways is because of the fact that they love to hunt in the water. They're very, they're very proficient with that. <laughs> awesome. And I'm going to take Bubba for a second here. So I'm going to get Sabrina to get the lovely lunch that we are about to show. So if you don't like to watch a snake eat, I'm warning you right now, turn away. Don't look at this. The bit. food is not alive, if anybody's squeamish <laughs> about that. Uh, we always feed frozen and thawed here. So we have some We have some silver sides here for her. I'm going to try and get them. Maybe we should switch the camera angle. So we can get a nice, good... Then we can get a nice good angle here. Pull it back so that everyone can see. Oh, there we go. Sorry. All right. So the primary sense that snakes use to hunt is actually their scent glands. So they don't look for their food so much as they do smell for it. Um, some different snakes can sense heat, um, but garter snakes primarily go off of scent. So she's just smelling for her food right now. And we'll see if she wants to eat. She might be nervous because she's usually fed inside of a bin. We can move these around a little bit too because moving it may also help. She looks mildly offended that we're trying to feed her lunch right she, now. Well, she's probably <laughs> camera shy. She's got stage fright going on right now. So let's see if she'll... Now we normally take Bubba out because she's got one of the best appetites here. Um, much like you, you might not want to eat in front of a whole bunch of strangers every day. So we normally feed them in a little bit more of a secluded space. So she might not be super hungry to eat this, but we'll try to get her to eat one of these fish. Now something really cool. So in case Bubba does latch on three, can you talk a little bit about their jaw and why and how they use their jaw to actually eat? So a snake's jaw is a lot different than a mammal's jaw or a lot of other invertebrates' jaws. Um, they, instead of having one solid jaw piece that's attached on either side, like ours, that's sort of a V or a U shape and goes up and down, their jaw is actually made of two different bones. So there's one on each side of their face, and the, those bones can move independently and spread out far apart from each other. They're sort of anchored together with these uh, muscles and ligaments that are a lot like elastic bands. So their face, for lack of a better word, their face can stretch out very far. <laughs> um, 
with this allows them to be able to eat something that is as large as the widest part of their body without chewing it or breaking it into pieces. So they're the only animal that can swallow something that is bigger than their head in one piece. And they always eat their food whole. They never chew it. Now I know there's two types of snakes. What type is um, Bubba here? And what are the two types of snakes and what's the difference? So when people think of different types of snakes, they mainly think of constrictors and they think of venomous snakes. So the really cool thing about garter snakes, which are in the culibrid family, is a lot of culibrids are kind of in the middle between the venomous snake and the constrictor. So they, they do somewhat constrict their food and they'll pull it with their whole bodies, meaning that they will squeeze it to death, basically. Um, but they also actually have mild neurotoxin venom that's produced through their saliva. So they don't inject it like a viper or another venomous snake would through their teeth, but it's delivered through their spit. So they, they grab their uh, prey and they use their teeth to poke little holes in it. And then the saliva gets into the, those little holes and the um, saliva carries the venom into the prey. Uh, fortunately, it's not something that would be medically significant, significant to humans or to any kind of large mammal or anything like that, but it does work for subduing small prey like fish and frogs and the other things that they eat. I'm really happy that they can actually subdue a human because the amount of times that Bubba has actually bit Sabrina has been a lot. She I've witnessed it live on camera and I have witnessed it behind the scenes multiple times as well. So I'm very happy that you haven't been poisoned by a snake. <laughs> yeah, some people do get a mild reaction to it. Um, when I was a kid, I used to get a reaction to it, but it sort of just felt like a mosquito bite. So it's definitely not something that is harmful at all. Um, but if they do bite you enough, you'll get a bit of a, an itch, I guess you could say. But she has bit me lots of times. I'm surprised she's not eating now, because usually, like you said, she is the most enthusiastic eater. But I do think it's the fact that she's never been in this room before. And um, we've got the bright lights and everything. So she's used to eating in a quiet, more included kind of calm area. And I usually feed her in the same bin. So she's probably just thrown off. Later, she's probably going to bite me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm glad that we don't have to that live once again. <laughs> now, she's not eating right now. How often do we actually feed our garter snakes, and how do they differ from the other snakes we keep? Because we have multiple species of snakes here. Yeah. And how do they differ with their diet and how often they're going to eat that prey? So that's a really good question. Um, it depends on the metabolism and the activity of the snake. Garter snakes are diurnal, so they're active during the day. Uh, and because of that, they are more active than um, a nocturnal species would be, whereas they need to be able to be alert during the daytime so that, like I said, they can hide from predators. Um, and because they're small and they have fast metabolism, they need to eat more often. So we feed them usually twice a week. The babies, um, Bubba actually had babies a while ago, and we feed those guys every second or third day. But the adults usually eat about twice a week, whereas the larger snake, like our ball pythons, for example, um, the adults usually only eat once a month, maybe twice a month if they're super hungry. But they can go a very long time without eating. Yeah, that's uh, I like to eat a lot more frequently than that. But I can tell you that this fish smells absolutely horrific. Yeah, it does not smell very nice. I'm surprised that Bubba doesn't want to eat it. I'm <laughs> honestly shocked because fish is one of her favorite, um, and they're more of a treat because they're kind of a junk food. She doesn't get them as often as she does wrapped in ice because those are more nutritionally complete. So for this, for her, this is more like McDonald's breakfast than a nice home cooked healthy meal. <laughs> um, but surprisingly, she's turning her nose up to it. So I. I Assuming it's just because she's in a strange environment. For sure. Um, now, we are going to be switching out to another animal pretty soon here, but the one favorite fact I have about garter snakes, I would love for you to elaborate a little bit more on. Um, how do our garter, well, garter snakes in general give birth? So I know it's different than most snakes. It is. So most snakes, uh, as many of you probably know already, lay eggs. Um, they, they find a good place for their eggs to uh, hatch and incubate. They'll lay the eggs there and they just leave and the babies uh, are independent once they hatch. Garter snakes, though the babies are also independent when they hatch, actually carry their eggs inside of them until they're ready to hatch and then the eggs hatch inside and the babies are born alive, uh, similar to mammals. So it's it's pretty crazy to watch. Um, both of our female garter snakes that we've had here uh, have both had babies on one occasion and one time I actually got a video of it and got to see it close up so that was really neat and then just recently on Canada Day actually Bubba had four babies that we're keeping too. So, but it's really neat um, because most snakes, as I said, will lay eggs. Um, I think 75% or more snake species lay eggs, but garter snakes and a couple of species of other culibrid species like walker snakes, um, they give birth wild. So it's very unique and very strange, but that's part of the reason that they're able to survive in so many different climates and different um, sort of environments is because of the fact that they don't have to pick an optimal place for their young to be born. They can 
change that place that they go and find the optimal place when to get first. So that's very cool. Okay, I'm gonna let Sabrina run and go get the next critter. We're gonna do a quick swipe uh, swipe out here and switch over to another reptile that we have. Um, its name is George, and I won't ruin the surprise until we see him up close and personal here, because he's a pretty cool guy to see, and I'm pretty excited to learn more about him with Sabrina. Now, quickly, if anybody's got any questions while we're switching out the animals, I'd be happy to either relay them back to Sabrina or to try to answer them myself. Um, we will have about three minutes here. All right. Well, while we're waiting, thank you again so much for all the feedback on YouTube and, and live people. This is great. Uh, well over 300 is joining us from across the continent, so it's so exciting to have you. Uh, Mr. Wong's class is supposed to know, uh, do snakes get sick? I like that question. I know that is a yes. That is definitely a yes. But what kind of diseases they have, that'll definitely be when Sabrina comes back, she can elaborate a little bit more here. Um, they definitely do get sick. We have battled a couple illnesses with our critters here before. Um, and we have a fantastic vet that's on staff now who actually helps to nurse them back together. So our animals here do get sick just like us, and they range from a cold to something a little bit more severe as well. And we like to nurse them all back to health to make sure they're all nice and healthy. Nice. So definitely relate that one to Sabrina. And we will have 20 minutes at the end, by the way, for all these extra questions. Tons of questions. In fact, what I want to do while we're bringing out our second animal is highlight something. Now, you mentioned at the top of your broadcast that you are working on being accredited. And I want to highlight why that's so important. We feature a lot of zoo programs. Uh, so if you go are in Canada, it's called CAZA, Canadian Association of Zoos and Aquariums in the U.S. and beyond. It's AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Now, wherever you go in the country, wherever you go in the world, look for this sort of accreditation that highlights that the the facility or the zoo is at the highest standard of animal care. I think we've all seen places before where animals are kept that aren't necessarily you know, kept very well, they get sick much more regularly, maybe they die even. And so when a place is accredited, it means that the top people in the world to make sure that that facility is as good as can be, come and verify that it is. So if you go to places that are accredited, anywhere you go, in your travels, locally close to home, you're making sure that those animals are well cared for and that that facility is fantastic. So I really am glad you mentioned that uh, and thank you for highlighting it. Uh, do we have time for one more question before we bring our second animal? All right. Let's see. So many snake questions. I'm going to answer as many of these in the chat as possible because I'm like a huge snake guy. Snakes were my life as a kid. Uh, Miss Woodley's class wants to know, why are garter snakes so small? <laughs> Ooh, okay, you know what? Sabrina's here with our friend George, so I'm going to bring her back here and she can answer really quickly. Um, why are garter snakes so small? Garter snakes are small um, just because of the fact that they live in a more northern climate than a lot of other snakes, but it's an evolutionary trait that they've had to build their certain niche in the environment. So other larger snakes um, would have had different regions. Like for example, we have the gopher snake in BC, which is really similar to the garter snake, but a lot larger. So they're there to take on the larger prey, basically. And garter snakes found their niche by eating smaller, easier to get items. Uh, and probably got smaller with time as they as their evolution progressed that way. So. Beautiful. All right, we've got another critter here, and I'm so very excited to welcome you and introduce you to George. As I told, he does like to pee on Sabrina, so if you see anything liquid coming off there, don't worry. We're, we're trained to handle these, and we've had a lot of pee on us before. <laughs> it's, it's probably going to happen, and I'm prepared for it, so uh, I've accepted that already. So this here is George. Let's try and get him closer to the camera here, and I'll put this down. This is just in case he decided to make a mess on the way up the stairs here. Um, so George is, as you can see, whoa, <laughs> quite a bit bigger than our garter snakes, and he is super adventurous, so he's going to be harder to get to hold still than the garter snakes were. Um, also, George is wild caught, whereas Bubba was born here, so Bubba's a little bit more chill about just being handled and being in captivity, whereas George is a little bit less agreeable, but he's pretty good. He wants to explore. He is always on the move. And Jamie to the other game. Yeah, so George here. There we go. We're trying to get George to stay still for a second. He thinks that he's trying to, trying to run away. He doesn't want to. Now he's going to pee. Oh, and now it's time for the urine. So, live yeah. action. It's so much fun. We always get a nice peeing on every once in a while. It's just how they say that they love us. And we should, like, take bets that. on how long that's going to take because it's guaranteed to happen. <laughs> All right. He's come down a little bit now, though. He's like, yeah, I'm just going to poop on the table. Um, <laughs> so George here, as you can see, is quite a bit larger. Now, George is a blue tongue skink, and the, the cool thing about George is normally the blue tongue skinks that you'll see in captivity um, in pet stores or in zoos and things like that are often the Australian species of blue tongue skink. George here is called a Maracay blue tongue skink, um, and he is from Indonesia. 
So the Australian species are often um, bred in captivity. You don't see um, wild caught Australian skink species because of the laws there. You're not allowed to export them anymore. So they can't gather them up from the wild and sell them for the pet trade um, as they used to. Whereas the Indonesian species, sadly, they can still export them. So most Indonesian skinks are wild caught, like George here. Um, and so they often do times have a little bit more of a hard time adjusting to life in captivity than the Australian version. But they are still super cool to interact with and really neat to observe. Um, and a really, really sort of, they're very unique because of their, their snake-like appearance, but they're, they're definitely a lizard. We often had kids whose body was a snake when they saw him sticking out of the dirt because he's still on the skinny. Uh, but he's not a lizard. He's very much a lizard. <laughs> I, uh, he definitely does look like a very fat version of a snake with just a couple teeny, teeny, tiny T-Rex arms is how yeah. I like to describe George to the public. Now, if you do get to see, we're trying to hopefully get up a close-up soon. He's calmed down a bit. Yeah. But his tongue is blue. So if you do see that, that's where that name comes from, right, Trina? Mm, yeah, if I put him down, he might get out of time. <laughs> as soon as I put him down, he wants to run. Yeah. So they, the name does come from their, oh, there we go, their blue tongue. She might show up, she might not. No, he's just gonna sit yeah. still. So the really cool thing about that tongue is it's actually a predatory defense mechanism. So when they are out in the wild, um, they often get eaten by things like birds, especially. Um, there are a couple of different other animals that would eat them in their wild habitat, but most of their predators that go after these guys are birds. And the way that birds see that, that tone of blue, um, Basically, when the light hits it, it reflects really brightly. So we just see blue, but to a bird, um, especially birds of prey, it would look like a light shining out of his mouth. So if he saw something coming up from above him um, and he felt like he was being threatened, he would open his mouth and stick that tongue out. And the back of the tongue is actually a lot brighter blue than the tip that we see when he's sticking it out. Um, so when he's threatened, he opens his mouth up and it would basically look like a light shining out of his mouth. So most birds, if they were coming down to eat something and suddenly it shone a light in their face from inside its mouth, it, it's a pretty good defense mechanism because it throws them off. <laughs> I would definitely run away from a reptile with a light shining out of its mouth. That would freak me right out and I'd be out of there. I'm not trying to eat George. Now, yeah. one thing that's so, uh, I can see so well on George, but I know that the garter snakes have them as well, is those holes in the side of his head. Yeah. What is that? So let's turn that way a bit. We can see those big holes on the sides of George's head are his ears um, and the inside is it doesn't fully go through it's covered by a thin membrane so a little flap of skin that keeps the dirt out of his ears um, but it does allow sound to travel through these guys are a burrowing species so that's why they have that flap some species of lizards will actually have a hole like with example the crested geckos you can see right through their head if you shine a light through it um, George on the other hand uh, has those little flaps to keep the dirt out because skinks are burrowers so he spends in the wild, he spent a lot of his time digging underground, and here he does spend a lot of his time digging in the dirt. Will often come up with a little pile of dirt on his head, um, and that those those specially shaped ears keep the debris from getting inside. Now, this is to learn about what they are eating. So I'm curious to the audience, if anyone wants to type in the chat what you think George might be eating. I know he's got a pretty varied diet, um, and while everybody's typing away, uh, maybe we'll actually go over. So do snakes. And does George here, the blue tongue skin, actually smell the same way with their tongue? So yeah, um, almost all lizards and snakes, well, all snakes and most lizards, um, do have scent receptors inside their mouth. Um, the snakes work a little bit differently in the sense that they have actually a special organ on the roof of their mouth. Um, so when they bring their tongue back in, they stick it into these little grooves in the tops of their mouth, and, and that's what sends the, uh, the scent through basically to their brain. So with George, um, as soon as he sticks his tongue out, he can smell it the same way as if you were breathing in through your nose, whereas the snakes have to bring their tongue back into their mouth. But it does work in the same sort of way. Um, and it is one of their primary senses. Again, it's the scent. Um, so they, they both hunt with that and avoid being hunted with that. <laughs> That's very cool. I always learn so much whenever I get to hang out with Sabrina and our critters. Now we do have one answer here from the live, um, the, the questions that are live there. I wonder if Jesse's got a couple more answers for us on what do blue tongue skinks actually eat? 
I got tons. So my favorite sort of bigger one is small birds. That'd be terrifying. The skin just running through attacking cardinals. Um, we got rodents. We've got butt. We've got anything that can fit in his mouth, which is an answer for the snake as well. I like where people are going with this. Uh, insects is our biggest answer. So most people are thinking the bugs is uh, our thing for, for George here. What do we think? Hmm. Those were, those were all great answers. Um, the Indonesian species, I don't think they ever eat birds. Uh, the Australian species, I know, has been documented eating small birds before. Um, they're all, they're, the heads are a little bit larger than the Indonesian species. Um, but I think more or less it's just the types of the species of birds that exist where they live, whereas the species of birds that exist where the Indonesian species live are a little bit too big to be eaten by them. Um, so baby birds, for sure, if they had the chance, I think. Uh, as well as other things that you guys were saying, uh, other small animals like rodents and stuff like that. Um, but in the wild, their primary source of protein is actually snails. They love snails, mollusks, things like that. So any types of small invertebrates, crabs, things like that. Um, but they also eat plants as well. So George here absolutely loves banana. Um, in the wild, I don't think he would find bananas, but he, they do eat lots of different fruits as well as greens like weeds, dandelion, things like that. So they do have a pretty varied diet in terms of what they eat um, and they are opportunistic omnivores so they will also eat things like carry on if they find like a, a carcass of another animal they'll eat pieces off of it uh, something else is killed um, but most of what they eat that isn't uh, most of the meat that they eat that isn't um, something that was already dead would be snails slugs and things like that Awesome, and I think that we're getting pretty close to the time where we want to open up for questions. I'm sure we're going to have a ton of questions for everybody. Uh, so that being said, Jesse, if you want to let everybody in, we can start to answer on anything you want to know about a garter snake or George here, the blue tongue skin. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for that awesome tour of some of your coolest creatures. Again, we've got so many folks tuning in on YouTube, hundreds and hundreds of kids. If you guys have questions, start sharing them in the chat. What we're going to do to begin is go to our live class. So Miss Yip's class is joining us. Uh, we're going to head to them to check it out and uh, take a question. Actually, they've got their devices off right now. So if you want to turn your camera on, turn your mic on, Miss Yip, we'll come to you guys in a minute. We're going to head to a family at home, Ezra and Piper. If you guys want to kick us off, just unmute that mic, and you'll be good to go for our very first question for their Exploration Place team. So welcome in, guys. Come on in. Hi. Hi. Unmute your mic. We want to hear from you. Hey, hi, George. Hello. Hey. Ezra's hiding over there. She's right there. <laughs> hi. We're in oh, Prince George too. Oh, Prince George family. That's so exciting. We oh, missed the exploration place. Oh, we're looking so forward to having you back in here as soon as these renovations are over. We can't wait. No, we so miss you guys too. <laughs> awesome. Did, oh, you, I, did you have any questions about our animals today or did you just want to say hi? Nope, that's okay. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> if you have any, let me know and I'll come back in a little bit, okay? I'm gonna to head to Surrey, right down, uh, right down the province, to Miss T's class, grade threes. Come on in. Yeah, I also wonder how long well they live in T's class. Hey, Miss T. Okay, I'm gonna turn the volume back on. Very You're nice. good. You're all set. Back on. It wants to work. <laughs> Question period is exciting. Miss T, can you hear us? Are you good to go? Yes. We are. Sorry. Yes, we are. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. All right. Uh, Katie, did you want to go ask your question? Remember to say hi. Hi. Hi there. Hi. How many pounds do they eat a day? Which one? The How snake. many pounds do they eat a day? That is a really good question. So I bet George would eat like 10 pounds a day if you let him because he just won't <laughs> stop. But unfortunately, he can't because he'll get sick and he'll just keep eating. Um, George actually doesn't need to eat very often. He has a really slow metabolism. So that means that he can eat a little bit and stay healthy for a long time. George eats about two or three times a week and he usually eats about a tablespoon or two of food each time. So he doesn't need a ton of food. What about Bubba? Well, how much do the garter snakes eat? Because they are very hungry critters. They eat a lot for their size. Um, they usually eat a rat that's about the size of the widest part of their body twice a week so or or a fish of the same size or the same sort of weight in worms so they definitely eat quite a bit that would be like you eating it would be like you eating 10 cheeseburgers and then not eating for the rest of the week and then eating 10 cheeseburgers again at the end of the week i mean sometimes <laughs> 
I yeah, I feel like I'd like to do that. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Very bad, but very good at the same time. Awesome, guys. All right. Um, Miss Yip, again, let me know you're joining us in Vancouver if you do want to come in for questions, but we will head to Thunder Bay all the way in Ontario for Miss Delpino's class. Um, I know you guys are having some tech difficulties earlier, so I'm gonna come in. Hope that the audio is working, and if it's not, type the question in the chat bar. We'll take it that way. And then I'll head to YouTube. We've got a whole bunch coming in on YouTube, more than we could possibly do. But hello, Miss Delpino's grade fives. Hi. Hi. We've got a friend here, but yeah, we still can't hear you guys. So let's type it in the chat, and I'll share it in just a second, okay? All right, while we're doing that, I'm going to take a question from Miss Oliveira's class. How can you tell the gender of a snake? This is something that we've been getting in a lot in the chat. And what parts of the world do we find the most snakes? That is a really good, those are both really good questions. Um, so like I said, with some snakes, you can tell just by their size, um, garter snakes, water snakes, for example, um, ball pythons, those guys, the females are a lot bigger than the males. So if you have two snakes that are the same age and one is a lot bigger or growing a lot faster than the other, then the chances are that that one is a female. Um, vets have certain tools that they can actually look inside the snake with to, to confirm for sure and know 100% whether it's a male or female. Um, but if you're just trying to look from the outside, that is the best way to tell it. It's probably the size. And then for species that that rule doesn't apply to, so for example, corn snakes, um, you can actually look at the base of their tail, where their vent is, which is basically their butt. That's where everything comes out of. Um, their eggs, their pee, their poop, everything comes out of one hole. And if you look at the space between that hole and the end of their tail, that can actually tell you if it's a male or a female. So the males have a much larger space just because all of their organs are stored between the vent and the tail. And then the females have a shorter space because they don't have those organs, so they don't need the space to store them there. How cool is that? That word of the day for all our young kids is cloaca or cloaca. Yes. Um, is the, the universal hole for all that stuff. Not exactly our favorite concept to think of as humans, but a pretty very cool thing in other creatures. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, let's keep going to YouTube. We're going to come back to our live classes in just a minute. Miss Delpino, if you want to type more questions in the chat, please do. I like this question from Elaine. Um, I'm going to answer it if you guys don't or are skittish. Do snakes or can snakes eat people? What do we think? <laughs> so definitely. Snakes can definitely eat people. Uh, the snakes we have here could not eat people because they are too small. Uh, we have had Bubba try to eat my finger on New Bern's occasion, but she <laughs> didn't succeed and uh, I'm sure she'll try again. However, there are snakes large enough to eat humans. Um, the reticulated python would probably be able to eat a small human. Um, and there are actually snakes like the anaconda, which can eat a full-size person, probably about my size. I'm about 5'9", um, and they could easily eat me. There have been cases of people being eaten by snakes yep. in certain parts of the world, but it's really a very, very, very rare thing to happen. Yes. And it definitely doesn't happen um, in North America, to my, <laughs> to my knowledge. Um, very often. <laughs> It'd be very, very surprising if the garter just like opened his mouth that wide. But yeah, three species of snake in the world. We've, we've recorded eating people in the history of man. Um, again, these are like 20 to 25 foot snakes. And they were yeah. eating deer too, like a full size deer. If you've ever seen a deer, there are snakes that eat deer and antelope yeah. and millions, which is wild to think about. Um, I want to. 500 pounds, so. <laughs> They're just a fantastic creature. Um, yeah. I, I want to share one just quick note uh, for our folks at home, just in case you don't get this question. The place on Earth with the most snakes in any one location on this planet is in Manitoba. So every year the garter snakes come out there. Uh, it's the biggest agglomeration of snakes on the planet. Uh, you can see this in a recent BBC documentary. So look up Manitoba garter snakes. I'm going to try and get you guys a link to check it out later, but it'll blow your mind. So hope you guys... That's a really good video. <laughs> Those that don't like snakes. Yeah. Look away. Also, yeah, there's two videos I'll share with all our classes today. It's pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> all right. Uh, Mr. Anderson wants to know, can people have a blue tongue stink as a pet? Yeah, you definitely can. Um, like I was saying, the Australian species is pretty common in the pet trade, and those guys are all captive bred. So that means if you if you purchase a captive bred animal over a wild caught animal, you will have better luck keeping it as a pet. Wild caught animals tend to have more health problems, more behavior problems. Um, so a skink like George probably wouldn't make the best pet because he was born in the wild, but an Australian blue tongue skink, which is what you'll typically find in pet stores and things like that, those guys actually make wonderful pets so long as you do all of your research ahead of time and you're prepared to be able to provide them with everything they need because they do have quite complicated care as compared to like a cat or a dog. Yeah. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Snake reptiles are, are they're beautiful, they're fantastic. I had a snake when I was a boy, but they do require a lot of specialized care and a lot of specialized research. So make sure you do that if you're gonna get one as a pet. Definitely. Um, 
We had a question in the chat that I love. I answered this on YouTube, but I want you guys to say it out loud. When you're touching George and you're touching Bubba, do they feel slimy in any way? Oh, that's a great question. And I get asked that all the time when we're open to the public. Um, so they, most people think that they are slimy because they look so shiny. The reason they look shiny like that is actually because their scales are made out of keratin. So that's the same thing that your hair and fingernails are made out of. Um, so that's what their scales are made of. And it's just reflecting the light, so it looks shiny. Uh, but they aren't slimy. They're not wet at all. They're actually really dry. Um, amphibians are slimy, so frogs and things like that, because they have a mucous membrane all over their body. But skinks and snakes and other lizards and things like that, those guys are all dry. They're just shiny because of the light. <laughs> I really hope all our students, if you haven't had the chance to touch a snake or touch a lizard in your life, do. Like, it's a really spectacular creature and, and creatures that a lot of people are afraid of instinctually. Um, if you give them a chance, they're really very, I mean, other than the fact that we were talking about eating people earlier, ignore that bit. Um, really friendly, really nice, really spectacular animals. So I hope everyone gets that chance either at the exploration place personally, like some of our live groups today, or wherever you might find yourself across Canada or the U.S. All right, uh, Miss T's class, if you guys have a second question for us, I'll bring you back in the broadcast. Miss Delpino, I know your devices are giving you trouble, but I'll share your question in just a minute. Miss T, come on back in. All right, we're, we're working our way up to the crowd. Why does the snake not eat dead, dead uh, animals? Yeah. That's a good question. Sometimes it's really hard to convince a snake or get a snake to eat a dead animal. So we do feed all of our snakes animals that have already been killed here for a couple of different reasons. Um, but we have to try and make them think that the animals are alive sometimes. So the reason that snakes don't eat dead things is because they want their food to be really fresh and they typically don't eat something that's not moving because they don't know how long it's been dead. Uh, and there are lots of different things that can make them sick if they eat something that was already dead. If George eats something that was already dead, like I said, he eats, they will eat carry-on and things that have been killed by other animals. He has different bacteria that will help keep him healthy so he can eat dead things without getting sick. Uh, snakes, on the other hand, can't. So they just eat things that are alive. Here we feed them frozen and thawed, but we usually have to move things around with tongs to make it look like it's alive. So then they'll think that it's ready to be eaten. <laughs> yeah, great question, guys. All right, uh, we got this question from Guru Nathan on YouTube. It's like a showdown. We've got like beast wars going on. Do blue tongue skinks attack snakes? Is, it like a, is there a reason you kept them so far apart? What's going on? That's uh, actually, that's, that's a good question too. Um, if we were to let George and Bubba out together, George probably would definitely try to eat Bubba. Um, because blue thumb skinks do eat small snakes and small um, other, other small lizards and things like that, uh, if the size was right and the snake was small, a blue thumb skink would definitely try to eat it. However, though, if you had a large snake and a skink like George, then George would be at risk of being eaten. So it's definitely the size plays a huge factor in the cycle of life and in the food chain for these guys. Dog eat dog world out there in our, our live animal interactions today. Um, I want to share the one from Ms. Delpino's class. Again, I'm sorry you guys are having tech difficulties, but thank you so much for joining us. They want to know a question that a lot of our YouTube groups want to know, which is how old will George be? And you guys can extend that to our snake friend as well. How old are these creatures getting? All right. So right now, George is about three years old, so he's pretty young. Blue tongue skinks can live anywhere from 15 to 20, 22 years in captivity. Um, I think the oldest one that somebody has had on record was 28 years old. So that, that's pretty impressive. Um, so hopefully George will be here for a very long time. He seems pretty healthy. Um, and he, like I said, he's only three. He won't get too much bigger than he is, maybe an inch or so. And garter snakes usually live in the wild. They only live about two years because of the fact that so many other animals eat them um, and there's things that can make them sick. But in captivity, they can live about 10 to 15 years or more. Very cool. Thank you so, so much for that. Reptiles in general tend to live longer than counterparts in the mammal world that are similar size. So reptiles can be quite long lived. We, a lot of us might know with tortoises, some of them can be over a hundred years old, which is really, really cool. So I love when we get that age question. Guys, time flies and you're having fun. We are approaching the end of the broadcast. And so what I want to do is 
briefly put you in the background just to highlight a little bit more about the series. First and foremost, uh, we are joined at the Exploration Place today. So I really encourage all our viewers, check out explorationplace.com. What an amazing place. And I'm so glad they're getting some renovations, cool stuff going on there. So I hope you get the chance to visit in person or see some of their virtual offerings online in the not too distant future. This of course is part of our epic Science Literacy Week across Canada, Canadian Association of Science Centers series called Week of Wonder. So we've got three more full days of amazing programs like this. We've actually had live animals in three straight broadcasts. If you're looking for more live animals or climate or space or whatever interests you, there's something to find at the Week of Wonder. And you can find all of that at our website, exploringbytheseat.com. Before we wrap up and I give all our live classes a chance to say a farewell uh, at the exploration place what is one message you want to leave all our kids with about reptiles about snakes and lizards uh, what can we we send our kids home with to inspire them to learn more or be excited about these creatures the way that you guys are i think the most important thing is to acknowledge that even if an animal seems gross or scary or creepy uh, it does have a role in the ecosystem so it has a role in nature and in the in the part of the world that it is found in so if you go outside and you see a snake or something that you think might be a little bit creepy or dangerous, even though it's good to respect them and to give them their space um, for your safety and for theirs, it's also really cool to be able to interact with them and learn from them and see what it is that they do that's important to the world around them. Um, even if you might think that they are not important, they are. So. <laughs> It's a beautiful message and I think, you know, as someone who loves biodiversity personally, as an organization that brings in so many species and, and programs on wild animals around the world every single week, um, it's, it's something that we hear from a lot of our speakers. And so thank you so much for that. I hope all our classes with this increasing uh, emphasis on outdoor education, take the chance today at the end of your day or as a class at lunch hour, go outside, see what you can find. You were talking about the, the Seek app and iNaturalist earlier, where you can go and explore and learn more about that wildlife. It's such a special opportunity. There's so much to discover, even if you're in the heart of the biggest city. And so uh, thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. I know we've got a bunch of devices a little odd today, but I'm going to bring in Ms. Teeson's class to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. And picture the hundreds of other kids around the globe doing the exact same. Ms. Teeson's class, thank you so much. And bye for now at the